Welcome to Balancing the Ledger, where tech and finance intersect. I'm Jen Vietchner. I'm Robert Hackett. And today, we are lucky to have Barry Silbert, the CEO of Digital Currency Group. Thanks so much for being here, Barry. Hi, guys. So DCG is a bit of a crypto conglomerate. Tell us a little bit about what you have going on now. So uh, yes, yeah, so DCG, um, so we're a company um, as opposed to a fund. Um, and we do three things. We uh, in invest in early stage companies. So we've now invested in 145 companies within the, the crypto and blockchain space. Second thing we do is we invest in digital assets. And so we make um, some very, very large concentrated uh, investments. Uh, we don't trade, we don't use leverage, we don't short, we just go long and then we help try to accelerate the, uh, the awareness and the utility of the ones we're excited about. Um, and then the third thing we do is we own three companies. And so we own uh, Grayscale Investments, which is the largest asset manager in the space, with about, uh, about $2 billion in, in AUM right now. Uh, we own Genesis, which has both a trading and a lending business, um, which is, again, one of the largest OTC trading businesses and certainly the largest lender out there in the crypto space. And then we own Coindesk, the uh, events and media company. Barry, you've said that you want to build a Berkshire Hathaway of crypto before. Uh, well, we just released the Fortune 500 list, and Berkshire Hathaway came in at number four. Uh, when are we going to see DCG on there? Uh, well, when I set up uh, Digital Currency Group, um, I set up as a company really to have flexibility. I wanted to be able to invest in companies. I wanted to be able to start companies, buy companies. I wanted to be able to raise money from strategic investors. I wanted permanent capital, I don't have to worry about having to go raise money a bunch of times, and I wanted to be able to go public one day. So um, at some point in the future, DCG may be publicly traded, and at that point in time, I uh, would love to uh, appear somewhere on that, on that list. Maybe right up there with Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. That's right, that's right. <laughs> so Bitcoin uh, is surging again, actually. You have some insight into the markets based on just everything you manage. I'm curious, are you seeing any trends, or what do you think is driving the price? If you follow um, the price of, of Bitcoin over the past uh, five, six, seven years, you know it, it goes through these patterns. Um, it goes up, and then the price goes down 60, 70, 80 percent, and then I guess now for f at least four times, it's hit record highs. The difference, though, between where we are today uh, relative to before the last bubble in 2017, I mean, it's really night and day from an infrastructure perspective. I mean, think about uh, the, you know, the custody providers and think about the trading infrastructure and think about the compliance software and think about the awareness and think about the on-ramps and the off-ramps. And so um, if we are, in fact, you know, entering crypto spring, it seems, it seems that we are, when you start adding... Uh, the fidelities and the you know the the the, the Robin Hoods and the squares and the backed and all these others um, as these on ramps. Uh, it's really just a matter of um, you know how quickly the the, the retail and the institutional money will, will come into the space. And so you know what we see behind the scenes are people are ready you know starting to open up their check checkbooks. Um, our asset management business Grayscale. Uh, put out its qu uh, first quarter report uh, not too long ago. And what's really interesting is, uh, one, the majority of the money that came into Grayscale in the first quarter was from institutional investors. And we saw um, a really, really large pickup in hedge fund money coming in. What was also interesting is most of it went into Bitcoin. Like over 90% of the money raised by Grayscale in the first quarter was in, into Bitcoin. So not much interest uh, on the altcoin side, at least from the institutions, mm -hmm. a lot of interest in Bitcoin. So the really interesting thing to me about this latest Bitcoin rally is that it's happened at a time when stocks are falling. There's a lot of concerns about the trade war that seems to be ongoing. Have you seen any patterns in terms of Bitcoin, the way that Bitcoin moves compared to stocks? I mean, are they moving in opposite directions? Well, it, it, it is certainly interesting that um, the price started ex, its accelerated move up um, right when the trade discussions broke down. Um, it, it certainly um, has performed you know, better than other historical stores of value investments like gold. And so I think, I think it's serving as a bit of, um, of a, of a, of a non-correlated asset, uh, which I think people um, certainly uh, always expected Bitcoin would be. And I think it, if you look at it over the past five years, when Brexit happened, Bitcoin went up. When Grexit happened, Bitcoin went up. Um, but Ultimately, um, I think you know the, the volatility that exists in Bitcoin. I think there's plenty of examples we can find where it certainly you know went down when these when these macro events happened as well. You tweeted flight to safety in Bitcoin. Do you believe that? Well, I, you know, certainly a bit tongue in cheek. Um, I do think that as a non-correlated asset class, I think it. I think people investors are starting to appreciate that um, when things do turn down, when there are these macro events, the institutions that are going to be selling off their treasuries or selling off their gold don't 
today have the Bitcoin to sell off. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that the money will move into Bitcoin, but it just means that you don't have the forced pressure of people selling the Bitcoin. You just came out with a major national broadcast advertising campaign talking about dropping gold, uh, making this into a little bit of a zero-sum game uh, between Bitcoin and gold. Tell us, uh, what's your thinking behind that campaign, and what are you hoping to get out of it? I grew up hearing these gold commercials, hearing about how you know, gold you know, should perform well when you know, kind of things are kind of going poorly. And um, as Bitcoin has matured, um, as it's become more resilient, um, as the on-ramps have been built, um, I really wanted to start a conversation around the possibility uh, that maybe for our generation, for a younger generation of investors, um, gold is not going to play the role that it did for our parents or grandparents, and perhaps it's digital currency and, and Bitcoin in particular that would play that role. Bitcoin is certainly much more accessible, so anybody who's a phone now in the world can access Bitcoin, but really more importantly, Bitcoin has real utility. Whereas gold, it's, look, it's used in jewelry, which is fine, um, it's used very, very small amount of electronics, and that number is going down very, very quickly. And so the biggest buyers of gold have been central banks recently. Whereas with Bitcoin, Bitcoin is creating a new financial system. It's eliminating middlemen and friction and cost. It's removing barriers. And if you think about the ability, uh, the value it can bring from a remittance perspective and, and from a you know banking the underbanked and the unbanked, um, that is real true utility. It's like saying, okay, what is the value of the internet? What's the value of email? Bitcoin has the potential to not just save society hundreds of billions of dollars, but also create real economic op opportunity around the world. Gold just, the more expensive it gets, the less useful it becomes. So you, there was something you said there that was a little bit ironic. You said central banks are buying a lot of gold, and that's contributing to its value. Um, dig into that, because a lot of people buy gold as a hedge against central banks banks, presumably, uh, and other currencies. So The bull case for gold is, uh, the investment thesis is, um, the, the destruction of the value of fiat currency. Um, and, and the reason why that would happen is, in their opinion, is that central bankers are making bad decisions around fiscal monetary policy. Yet, uh, as you mentioned, the largest or the most aggressive buyers of gold over the past five years have been central banks, namely China and Russia. So essentially, gold bugs are saying, we think the central bankers are idiots, but we also think they're really, really smart for buying gold. So then the question is, in that you know, financial apocalypse situation they're talking about, what will really happen? What, what will the IMF do with all of its gold? What will China and Russia and all those other countries do? And the bet that gold bugs make is that we're going to go back to a gold standard. Which I think, look, maybe it's possible, but I think the chances of that happening are very, very small. The more likely thing that's going to happen is the first thing that gets sold is the gold to prop up your currency. The, the countries are going to sell their gold before they sell their ports and their airports. So with Bitcoin, um, I think it could perform really, really well in that financial apocalypse situation. But really more importantly, um, I don't want to bet against the U.S. I don't want to bet against the U.S. dollar. I want to bet on innovation and growth. And, in, and investments in Bitcoin gives you the potential to invest or gives you the opportunity to invest in this new financial system. So you kind of get the, you get the upside, but you also get the, the downside protection as well. Given what you said about 90% of the inflows coming into Bitcoin at grayscale this past first quarter, I mean, does Bitcoin have a kind of an insurmountable lead? Do you see it as the long-term winner? There's a lot of use cases out there that these different protocols and tokens are targeting. The digital gold use case, uh, I don't see Bitcoin having much competition for that one use case. And again, if that is all Bitcoin ever is, if it all it ever does is displace the $8 trillion gold market, one, I think that that's a very big su success from an investor perspective. But I also think that that's also very, very good for society. Having a digital store of value that anybody can access with their mobile phone, I think, is incredibly enabling um, for people around the world. Now, I do think that Bitcoin will be more. I do think it'll be a financial rail. I do think it'll be a remittance tool. I think it'll provide uh, the infrastructure for a new financial system. Um, but if all it ever is is a replacement for gold, that, that's good, too. Your previous company was Second Market, where it was uh, people could trade shares of private companies. Many of those pump companies in the past few weeks have either gone public, Uber, Lyft, uh, you know, or are planning to go public, like Slack. 
Do you ever miss that business? I don't. Uh, after I sold it to NASDAQ, um, I, I've certainly watched from afar what's happened in both the private market and the public market. And, and it, like, I continue to think that the public markets um, um, uh, are, are broken in that they are no longer accessible for smaller, fast-growing companies. Um, the number of publicly traded companies is down something like 50% over the past 10 years, and I think that that's a shame. But what I am excited about is the innovation that's happening in the blockchain and the digital currency space, because I do think that there's really interesting experimentation around ways to raise money and the ways to invest in ideas and projects. And you know, I, I wasn't a fan of ICOs. We didn't really participate in that, in that craziness. But I do think that experimentation like that is important in things like security tokens. And I guess the latest flavor is IEOs, um, and I don't know, what, uh, initial exchange offering, perhaps. So I think, that that's, I think that that's, that's interesting innovation that I'm philosophically supportive of. And I do think that. You know, in the next 10 or 20 years, when you talk about capital formation, you know, taking an idea to market and getting it funded and giving investors liquidity, I don't, I don't, I think it'll look a lot different than, you know, raise money from seed investors and then VCs and then you take the company public on, on the New York Stock Exchange. I think it'll look much different. That also exists, but I think it'll look a lot different, enabled by this technology. You mentioned that you would like to go public with your company. Well, I said I, I, I might go public. I'm you, not sure that I want to go public, but okay, I might you, go public. You might go public. What is the process by which you would do that? It, would it be different than the typical sort of going out on NASDAQ or uh, NYSE? It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I actually haven't spent a lot of time thinking about um, um, the process. Uh, and, and really, ultimately, we would only do it um, if there was a reason to have public equity uh, that we could use for acquisitions, as an example. Um, we we're a very, very profitable company. We have uh, what I feel like are unlimited resources available to us right now. So a going public um, uh, process would really be uh, as a way for us to become perhaps more uh, acquisitive. Um, but as of right now, there, frankly, there aren't a lot of companies that I would want to buy. So I don't spend a lot of time thinking about how to fund them. Hmm. Well, we'll have to see. Thank you so much for being here, Barry. Good seeing you guys. Thank you. I'm Jen Vietchner. And I'm Robert Hackett. For more Balancing the Ledger, go to fortune.com. We'll see you next time.